a lot of explosions because we knew applications were not going to be happening. Um, it was a, it was a, a, in its truest sense a baseline test. In order to be able to really um, uh, conduct a fair test of whether or not aerial applications or other pesticide application practices are happening, um, are responsible for um, exposures that we might detect, we need to be able to test at the time that those exposures um, or those applications are happening. And that was what the spring application, uh, that spring sampling event was designed to do. So in terms of follow-up, I, mean, we, uh, I guess um, we said it in so many words, but I'm not sure any of us at this point said it as explicitly as this. But um, this investigation is ongoing. We, will, we are going to stay here. Um, we are committed to this investigation, to answering those, those six questions. We know those six questions. So um, the data that we have now, are, they're useful. They're important. But they are one, one, just one small bit of information. And, and again, very important to keep it in, in perspective. Um, so, uh, Josh, do you have, do you step before we can have a question or, or that you want to answer or? Okay. okay. Well, so how about if um, I turn this to the link next and please you stand up here? Did I, did I hand you a question? Kevin and I are teaming up here. All right. Yeah, we have a, a number of questions we're going to uh, attempt to address. For those that deal, uh, we're going to be able to talk about the forestry-related questions. For those that also deal uh, more broadly with herbicide uh, application, we may ask Mike Odenthal to, to step in and talk about the, uh, the agriculture uh, aspects of it. Uh, let's see, we have a question. Is it possible for an individual to acquire a copy of the logging and spraying plan application when it is filed and uh, and the spray report for a specific property. Um, um, there is a, uh, a notification that has to be filed for any activity on forest land, whether that be harvesting or uh, chemical application, burning, road construction, all those activities. Um, that notification, when that is turned into us, that does become public record. So you can obtain copies from that of those notifications from us. Um, there's also a process, a subscription process, which I know there's several individuals in this room that are members of that, where you can sign up ahead of time and for geographic sections. And uh, basically, if you have, say, section one in a square mile, any activity that comes to our office or notifications at that time, we will ship to you that information and you'll have an opportunity to comment on those. So you can get that information ahead of time that way or again, if you think that an, op an operation of any kind is happening near you, you can come in and we may have that, at which time, through public records request, you can't obtain that. But isn't that <coughs> just what might get sprayed, not what actually gets sprayed? That is correct. I, I wrote either that question or what exactly like it, and what I meant is like, when they actually spray, and they know what they spray, why not, within three days of that application, why don't they have to turn into forestry a list of what they actually really spray? that then people could get that. Okay, there, there is not a rule that requires that at this time. The application records that we are visiting about here that, you know, that have been turned into us through that big public records request or uh, information request rather, um, we will have that information for those units. But as far as the daily applications that Mike Udenthal spoke to earlier, that they are required to keep, those they have to keep and those are in the private applicators. They are not in the public hands. That's a big problem. Uh, how can you guarantee that the self-reported application statement is actually what has been applied? Uh, there seems to be too much room for, in, yeah, I'm going to say, in middle. Okay, uh, there. Uh, the daily application report uh, that the applicator fills out is, is self-certified. Uh, they are they are stating that those conditions were present at that time, and that's exactly the the compounds and formulations that they apply. Um, that that is how that is reported. Uh, certainly, the potential would exist if, if during an investigation that found that that information was not accurate. Uh, that would lead to some potential ramifications under uh, the EPA la uh, labeling um, laws for, for herbicide application, which would have a a sanction there. 
Uh, if it wasn't so awful, why won't they spray here when being tested? Um, I'm interpreting that this question is, is directed at, at some forest landowners who are opting not to apply herbicides during the spray season. Um, I would, I'm going to have to tell folks that, that you will have to ask the individual forest landowners what their decision is to, uh, on why they are not spraying uh, during this season. During the test? Only in the here. Test. They spray other places. Uh, once again, the, the forest landowner is making that decision on what they're applying. Obviously. Well, I mean, they the spray, are... The spraying averaging in 2,4-D up in McKenzie. Me. They are applying... Um, there are applications, and Jay showed those on the, on the uh, map here. Very so they are applying... They are applying herbicides within the study area. Unfortunately, what happened, there's not enough residences that signed up to be tested. That's that's the case. Those were they are still applying out. Elmira. <coughs> Justin City and Elmira have a completely di different topography, uh, topography that doesn't lend itself to aerial drift. Nor are they using the same forestry pesticides in those areas. Okay. Those are agricultural and Christmas tree farms. Okay, thank you. Well, there is a public comment period a little bit later. Okay. Um, we could stick to that. Did you guys get through your questions? Do you want to ask? Uh, we got a couple more. Got a couple more. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Was was the unit next to Triangle Lake School sprayed, and when? Uh, Link, you might have some perspective on. Mike might remember that better because I believe you were here. So we're talking the the, the hillside back to the school, right? Uh, no. Yes, there was an application made. It was a hack and squirt. So um, the uh, applicator that came in used uh, a machete or a hatchet to hack the vine maple, and then they uh, uh, applied a mazapir to the uh, maple itself, and uh, and then moved on to the next one. Is that what you guys think got into the school drinking water? We know that mazapir got into the drinking water right after that. I wonder why PARC <coughs> never actually find the applicator for getting a mazapur in the school drinking fountain water. I can't answer that. I, I can't address that for you, Dave. When could you? I'm sorry. I thought this was a written question and answer, not a public yeah. question and answer comment time. Yeah, I'm not actually I'm really going to ask yeah. you yeah. folks to, to, to contain it. They're gonna, they're gonna, you're going to have an opportunity to comment. But for just, let, just let us get through the questioning. Gary, you've had a chance to pose your questions. We'll try to answer them. We'll get to the comment period in just a little while. Okay. In, in fact, we're going to consolidate a couple questions okay. here. Uh, in the... <laughs> Uh, when will they spray Highway 36? And is the spray on the Highway 36 area the same as Triangle Lake? Um, Lake, I, that's, I don't know if we have enough information to be able to answer that. Again, you know, you look at uh, just a quick general answer here, and I think Jay spoke with earlier. They use certain chemicals at certain times of the year for certain types of vegetation. Um, as you stated before, there's about 10 or 11 primary chemicals used in forestry. Again, they're used at different times of the year or in different, different circumstances. Um, so those chemicals will be applied, say, in the Highway 36, Triangle Lake area. Those are used pretty much throughout Oregon. They're kind of forestry specific types of chemicals. So they are the same types of chemicals. Sure. I, I wonder if that questioner was asking you about the roadside spraying. Uh, if it was roadside spraying, that, that would be an issue for ODOT or <coughs> Yeah, ODOT, uh, and you guys know as well as I do, they're, they're right now working um, uh, to mechanically remove most of it. Uh, they have not said they won't spray um, in, in any circumstances, but they're trying to avoid it. Um, last I had conversation with them, I, did, I do not know of any plans that they are going to spray. Uh, don't take that to the bank because I'm not one of the guys that's in the in the, the circle of, of everything going on. Okay. Uh, now, one thing to remember, and most of you guys probably already know this, a lot of the herbicides that get used up in the forest are also labeled on the roadside. Okay, so we can see the same active ingredients there as well as in some of the uh, agricultural operations as well. Okay. Uh, what exactly are the pesticides or herbicides they will be spraying in this area? Um, once again, a very broad question. I think we spoke to that individual landowners can come up with their own forest management plans and their, uh, they would identify what chemicals they intend to use 
on a notification of operation, and then, but we don't know what gets applied until it's recorded in that daily applicator. <coughs> uh, and once again, that, that's kind of a broad question there. Uh, why did ODF wait until February to ask for the records uh, from the timber industry? Uh, there was a significant amount of time that was needed uh, to be able to, first of all, design a process uh, for, for asking landowners to supply their records. Uh, this was a fairly large scale records inquiry that ODF was making to forest landowners, uh, and we needed to have a process candidly on, on ODF's end to be able to handle uh, records coming in very quickly to maintain uh, a chain of custody on them, uh, to be able to handle uh, how they would be turned over to park. Uh, it has been the intent of ODF to fully comply with that, uh, that interagency request for information made by OHA. As, as I think I mentioned earlier, we are in the process of doing that and we'll have those records transferred to OHA at the end of this month. Maybe a salient question would be to tell us what the time frame has been on all that. Could you please continue to comments just for right now? Are you... Uh well, we're going to have a final. Uh, okay. uh, I'm going to condense this one slightly. It's it's fairly elaborate. Um, basically, the question is: uh, since spray records kept by a corporate landowner could contain information uh, that what that somehow links up to uh, potential spray drift or, or herbicide, uh, is it possible that the company could alter these records? since there is no copy filed with, with forestry immediately after the spray application is done. Yeah. Once again, as I mentioned, uh, the, the applicator is self-certifying that information that's on the application record. Uh, and our process, our, the Oregon Forest Practices Act does not currently have a mechanism for people submitting that information to forestry. Once again, there is the provision that the uh, applicator has to retain and when it's requested as a part of an investigation, they, they are required to supply it. We, would you support them needing to give forestry within three days of spraying okay. a list of what they actually spray? We're not going to comment okay. on that. Okay, really. I, you guys just need to try a little harder to, to respect the process that we've asked you to. Sure, the process okay. is for respect. The process is, the process is what the process is. We're going we're gonna to get through the questions and then we will have a period of time for you, you can take all the time you want to make your comments. But while you're, while you're interjecting and you're asking follow-up questions, it's, it's just going to slow us down. So, um, so I'm going to ask uh, EPA folks. You got a number of questions about air. Um, it was come on. <coughs> okay. okay. First, I'm going to whine. Dave got all the cool toxicology questions. <laughs> and all I got was the air sampling questions. <laughs> Sorry, I so, um, The first one is, please give a definition of volatility as you used it. And if I didn't explain that, let me apologize. Volatility is just one of those chemical terms we use. And it's just a, sort of a, a way to measure how... Oh, Tougher to explain than I thought. Uh, how much, you know, if you, if you have something, what's its preference? Is it preference in its normal physical state to be in a vapor or a liquid or a solid? And things like, uh, you know, I like to work with hazardous chemicals. Let's, let's use trichloroethylene, TCE. It's a liquid at room temperature. Why don't you use alcohol? People, people okay. don't know what it Alcohol. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan, thank you. Chemists are awesome. Um, anybody use fingernail polish? No. It's, it's, okay, it's acid. Has anyone ever used it? I <laughs> do. It's acetone. And you open up a bottle of fingernail polish, you can smell the acetone. If you're like me, you probably smelled a little bit more of it than you should. But um, that's because it's volatile. The more volatile a chemical is, the more it's going to be in the vapor phase in the air, the more it's going to... It's essentially, volatilization is evaporation. That's the simplest way to put it. Um, this one is, can you use volunteers to put up active 
in my life. Active error monitors in places where the spring is anticipated. But that's certainly a possibility. Um, yeah. We, I, you know, it may be a possibility with these more portable ones. Um, I don't think it's a possibility with the big high volume air samplers just because they're so. They're, when I say they're not portable and they're unwieldy to deal with, I really mean it. I mean, it's a, it's a two person job to carry one around. Um, it's just, they're just really not a practical type of sampler to use in the environment you want to, you want to use. It may be possible to do it. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> um, it may be possible to do it with. Um, with these, there are there are other issues which um, that might arise, but we just really haven't thought it through. So really, the answer is it, it may be possible, but um, I'm not going to. We'll see. We'll see how things transpire, but no promises. That's for sure. Um, if I if I was to lose that one. I'm, I mean, but I just had trouble. Had one thing to that was, but it, when we use volunteers, sometimes we look at the cost of the analysis and the investment in the analysis versus the cost of deployment. And so, if if you've got an analysis that may cost several hundred or even thousands of dollars on a bunch of pesticides, you want to make sure that you have a really representative sample and a valid sample. And so, by using professional sampling folks, you can help validate the validity of that sample. And so that's why when we have a really expensive analysis, we tend to want to use professional staff to collect it. Whereas in other things where it's perhaps not so expensive and the risk isn't so high, we tend to use volunteers more in the collection. I, I can also tell you in terms of, um, and I can't, obviously I can't speak for EQ, I can only speak for EPA, our lab won't analyze sample that's not collected by um, trained staff, and when I say trained, I don't necessarily how to hang a sampler, but we're a regulatory agency. We have a lot of laws that we have to follow, and one of them is anyone going out and doing sampling, or any sample that's analyzed the EPA has to have, this has changed just in the last year, 40 hour health and safety training, <coughs> an annual eight hour refresher, and now I'm told I have to have also a 24-hour refresher every five years or something. Once? I can, I'll be done with it after this year? That is, okay. So that's one of the, also one of the restrictions we have on, you know, using volunteers to collect samples. Um, they can collect samples, they can have them analyzed at a, at a private lab. Our lab would not be able to analyze them. So that is kind of a restriction. Uh, this, uh, this isn't really an air sampling question, it's a policy question, but it um, talks about how atrazine is uh, banned in the European Union, which it is. And the gist of the question is, essentially, why is it banned there and why is it not banned here? And I really can't speak to the way Europe does its laws. Uh, one of the reasons that, that it is banned is Europe operates, the European Union operates under what they call the precautionary principle Yay. in which, you know, they have to prove, things are essentially banned until you prove that they're safe. Oh. The United States oh. 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 I know you're not applauding me. <laughs> uh, and, you know, Laws get made by, not me, and the law is different here. And I know that's a terribly unsatisfactory answer to most of you, but that's just what the answer is. Can you help talk to someone at the EPA that could do that? <laughs> this one's a little bit uh, kind of confusing, but it's, it's the gist of the um, question appears to be, um, why not measure what how much of these um, herbicides are taken up in trees? Uh, you know, one of the people suggested um, measuring it on, say, bees' wings and something like that, which is a really, really clever idea. But 
Uh, as a toxicologist doing an exposure investigation, I want to know what the dose is of these chemicals to people. And in order to calculate that dose, to make an estimate of it, I need very specific type of data. I need concentration data. And in terms of air, in terms of, uh, concentration is measured as you saw Jay talking about micrograms per liter in the urine. I was talking about micrograms per cubic meter in air. And what that means is micrograms of the particular chemical, how many micrograms of that are in a cubic meter of air? This is very specific type of information. And unfortunately, that's the type of information that we need to calculate what the dose is to people. And it is because of the requirement of that type of information that the air sampling is turning out to be a bit more of a complicated process than, than we'd originally anticipated. Um, this one is, why didn't EPA create tests to be able to test the air for these chemicals decades ago? Um, the honest answer is, I don't know. All I know is, here's where we are today. Uh, if I were to make a conjecture, it would be based on that little slide that I showed of the, uh, what's the air concentration, of, you know, the maximum air concentration you could have in these chemicals, and those were pretty low concentrations. And I, I am not implying that those concentrations are without some sort of adverse effect. I'm just saying that they're fairly low concentrations, and probably the belief was that they weren't high enough to make it something that people were concerned about. That's kind of changed now, and so we are in the process of developing those methods, but it wasn't done before, and I really can't speak intelligently about why it wasn't done before. Hi, I'm Scott Young from EPA Pesticides. And I don't know the answer to why uh, air modeling uh, capabilities aren't uh, available. Uh, so again, I don't understand either, just like Elizabeth, the, the real reason why we don't have the air sampling methods in place for all the herbicides that we're interested in here. Um, I know there's been air sampling and other kinds of pesticides that are more volatile in nature, like so fumigants, because we wanted to, those are. Uh, Pesticides that do commonly drift off target and are very toxic and so some methods have been developed for that. So I'm sorry. Um, I'm guessing it's just there hasn't been a great enough need yet to measure that, but you know, you're helping us see the need for that and we're working on those methods now. Let's put this working hard on those. Um, I have a more uh, broader question that's similar to the precautionary principle that uh, Elizabeth discussed and it's you know, why are corporations allowed to, to spray pesticides even though Human health risk has never been adequately adequately assessed. Uh, so I can explain a little bit about the registration process that happens at a national level at EPA back in um, Beltway, uh, and it's all based on the federal pesticide law called FIFRA, uh, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Organicide Act. Got that right? Um, and the standard for registering pesticides is that it's the scientists look at the risks of that chemical and determine whether they feel, the whole team of scientists, many of them, risk assessors, toxicologists like Elizabeth, whether those pesticides will, in their opinion, cause an, an unreasonable adverse effect to human health or the environment. And if they determine it does, then those pesticides aren't allowed or they're allowed with certain restrictions. They can only be used on certain crops in a certain way with certain application equipment. They can't be used in homes. So there's all kinds of a uh, whole range of uses that are allowed for specific uh, pesticides. Uh, so when a pesticide registers, they look at the science that's available at the time, and there can be hundreds, literally hundreds of studies that they look at from across academia, from the, some of them are more yes supplied by industry, uh, but we look at all the information that's available at the time. But uh, that doesn't mean we stop there. There is a process in place where every 15 years, at a minimum, all active ingredients are examined again for new science that comes available. And some of this new science can be generated through exposure investigation, for example, that we're trying to conduct here. Um, and it's not necessarily always a 15-year process. If 
we find compelling new evidence that there are these unreasonable adverse impacts um, happening, uh, that uh, pesticide can be moved up in the schedule with that, uh, sooner than the 15 year cycle. Uh, just as an example, uh, an FY or uh, federal fiscal year 13, which starts in October, the two pesticides we've been talking about a lot here today after season two for a year are on what's called the docket to begin the registration review process. So um, a lot of new information you know, that's been obtained since the last time these chemicals are registered is going to be re-examined for whether it meets that standard of uh, no unusual uh, impacts. Okay, you want to add anything? Is that okay? Uh, Frank, Brian, you guys want to? Okay, I've got a couple here. I'll go through. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Is it on? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to ask this first question. I actually don't quite have all the information. This is a question regarding uh, well water and surface water testing for atrazine and private property. It says Coos County. So is the question, is it about whether or not we have tested for atrazine in surface water or well water in Coos County? Does anybody know? The nature of this question. It doesn't matter. As long as state of Oregon, that's what the question I have. Okay, so um, I'll briefly touch on that. So, um, atrazine is um, we have not tested in Coos County for 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 this, but in the state of Oregon, we have. Oh, you can get that test done at any number of private laboratories. Yeah. You can find them in, actually. You can find them in the in the yellow pages, or if you get onto our website, DEQ website, under laboratories, there will be a list of laboratories that could do that. I can't name them all right now, but and actually, what we can do yeah. for those of you who are on the list, sir, we can um, we can send out a message with that link with that to the DEQ website, yeah. so that we make it easy to, to get over. I will say that what DEQ has done in its pesticide testing in groundwater has focused primarily on agricultural areas, not forestry areas, because we believe that's where the greatest risk to groundwater quality from pesticides has occurred and that within the Willamette Valley atrazine is the most commonly detected pesticide within the Willamette Valley groundwater. Approximately 50% of the samples of over 300 samples we've collected in the Willamette Valley have one or more pesticides in and we've detected as many as 17 different pesticides in groundwater samples out of the Willamette Valley. Almost all of the concentrations are well below drinking water standards or health advisory criteria. There are a few exceptions but atrazine is the most commonly detected pesticide generally across the state and groundwater. And as far as surface water goes, usually we, we find different pesticides in, in surface water. Atrazine is not the most commonly detected. I believe diuron is the most commonly detected surface water uh, pesticide that we found in the state. Uh, again, most of our surface water testing is focused in agricultural areas. We've done one study that uh, was involved the whole coastal coho ESU, and we detected a few forest herbicides and a few sites and a few samples as part of that study. Uh, that's what we've had in terms of surface water for forest pesticides. The next question I have is, um, since air sampling seems to be so problematic for PARC, why not sample surface waters because there, there are numerous protocols for the assessment of many analytes, not just for atrazine and 2,4-D. Uh, is there, if, there exposure, if there is exposure through air drift, it will get to the surface water. So I think the answer to that question is kind of a study design question is we wanted to look at there's different ways that people could be exposed to these herbicides. They could either eat them or drink them, they could inhale them, or they could absorb them through the skin. So as part of this process we were looking at the most likely avenues of exposure. So we looked at the drinking water and the food sources in the September sampling of last year to see if that was a possible route of exposure. Now the route of exposure that we want to look at which I think Elizabeth has said is probably the most likely if there is a route, would be the air exposure. So that's why we're concentrating on the air exposure. When we do surface water sampling for pesticides, what we found is most of the, we suspect, and, and the evidence would indicate that most of the pesticides we find in surface water either gets in through direct di drift of the particulates or the droplets into the water themselves, or they get washed in by runoff uh, into the waters but not through that volatilization and other routes of exposure that are being investigated right now. <coughs> so I had two questions around the environmental data that um, our lab and, and uh, ODA's lab did. And uh, there were some results released that had void um, in them. And the reason for the void is uh, we have certain quality assurance protocols that the laboratory uses 
um, to ensure that our data quality. Um, when those are exceeded, um, if we do not receive recovery of our spike compounds or there's an invalid calibration, um, we void those results. But at all times, anytime we see a detection in a sample, we still report the result. Um, so if there was any detections of the compounds, you would have seen a nanograms per liter or micrograms per liter result. Um, if there was, it was non-detect and the QA, QC element failed, then we void the results because there is a potential there for what's called a false negative um, when some, a small amount could have been there and simply because the, the lower calibration values that we had or the low recoveries that we have in our QC, um, we may have missed it. Um, so that's where the voids come in. But at, I reassure at any time that there if there was a detection in any of those samples where you see void, you would actually see uh, the, the compound itself and what the concentration was. Why were the voids on the same test results and everyone's test results in the same chemical? Um, I'm asking you. They were all ran at the, at the same time on the same an instrument. These, these were received in three separate runs and we ran them all at the same time and we had a problem with that particular instrument. Um, what we have is a second source that we use um, to validate our calibration and that, ca that validation standard came out at like 500% recovery. Um, what that's telling us is that our calibration itself is invalid. Um, from a, when you look at it from the results standpoint, what it's telling us is we had actually, if there was a detect, we'd actually bias it high. So the fact that there were non-detect, we're pretty sure that they were non-detect. There was nothing there because our second source is coming up 500% recovery in that case. Um, each compound was slightly different. Um, the four other compounds related to an ICV failure um, and uh, a five-point calibration when we need a six-point when they're quadratic. So it's simply... <laughs> Uh, Sorry. Uh, turn that back into English. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's standing here. <laughs> whenever, <laughs> whenever we do a calibration, so we, when we have an instrument, we have to calibrate that instrument with a known compound. Um, we use different concentrations to tell us, to give us a signal on that instrument. Um, when we build those calibrations, we have to have a certain number of points to be able to build that calibration line. Um, when we build a, a linear, a line, um, we have to use five, and if we develop something that's called quadratic, it's, it's a different type of calibration, we have to have six. In this case, we had some low end failures and we had five points, so we void the results. Again, if there would have been a detection, it still would have been reported as you know what the value was instead of void. Brian, can I just add something? I wanted to mention this, I forgot, but it relates to the question about using the volunteers and it was also about the results that they presented earlier. And it's a good example of what we're talking about in terms of quality control. Even with using professional samples, the deep results that were presented earlier where there were, I think, three samples that had deep in them, two or three, the blank from those samples came back with the hit in it as well. The blank should be clean. So that would indicate a possibility of some kind of contamination. These concentrations that we were looking at are so unbelievably small. What's a quadrillion of postage stamp in this area? So uh, to kind of give you a, a, a viewpoint, um, of what concentrations are that we're talking about. Um, the parts per trillion, or PPT, sometimes written as nanogram or NGL, uh, um, it's a, we're looking at a postage stamp at the size of California and Oregon together. So just to give you an idea, you find a postage stamp in all of California and Oregon, that's one PP, what we call PPT or nanogram per liter. Would you rather drink some water that has a little bit of it? Or hang on, hang on, hang on. So that's, that's I mean, we're looking for extremely small amounts. Um, so contamination, and DEET is one of those ones where um, the blanks tend to come back with some value because there's just a lot of um, DEET. Um, there's, I mean, it's in clothing, it's in all kinds of consumer products, but it's extremely low. For whatever reason, they didn't pass our very strict quality assurance requirements and some of that data we won't be able to use. That's just uh, the, the realities that we have to live with in this business. Okay, so while we're, while we're on the, in the toxicology realm, Dave, okay, you wanna? Sure, um, so I got the cool toxicology questions that uh, Elizabeth talked about. Um, so they're all about 24D. Uh, the first question is, is 2,4-D an endocrine, endocrine disruptor? And I think there's uh, sufficient evidence out there to, to suggest that it is. Um, 
I thought most most talks about this nowadays believe that it is an endocrine disruptor. Do you want to describe uh, an endocrine, endocrine disruptor? Is a right any any a chemical that that alters the hormonal system. So um, you know a lot of life is run on hormones. The thyroid hormone that controls you know a lot of things about our metabolism, how fast we burn calories or don't burn calories, or when we wake up and when we go to sleep, and and how we feel in general. And then you know. The sex hormones are important for, you know, that. And uh, <laughs> uh, development, reproduction. Um, uh, so, it, uh, and a, a reason that it's important, uh, an endocrine disruptor, the big, the, the scary thing about endocrine disruption is, is when, um, especially in the developing fetus, in a, in a baby that's growing, um, if, if a change happens in the hormone system early on, uh, that can induce a, po a, a permanent change, so that um, the baby will be born and probably be, probably appear fine and, and normal for, for most of its life, and then there's there, some disease occurs later in that in that child's life, and, and that can be traced all the way back to um, to that exposure that happened to that endocrine disruptor when the baby was in utero. So so that's why. You know that's why there's been a lot of news kind of lately about endocrine disruptors, and, and that's sort of that's that's why it's something that uh, toxicologists are concerned about. And really small doses, right? Right, and, and oftentimes very small doses. And uh, I'll talk about that in just a minute too. Let's, a follow-up question gets me to that. Uh, another one is: Is 2,4-D a carcinogen? Um, if that one it sort of depends who you ask. Um, and a carcinogen is a carcinogen is a chemical that causes cancer. Um, the, right, I don't. Right now, EPA does not classify it as a carcinogen. Um, there's some studies that suggest that it is, and some that suggest that it isn't. So it, it's kind of right. And another, uh, there's another, an international agency that uh, that does research on cancer also says that it's it's not a, a carcinogen. Um, but like I say, um, it's up for re for reevaluation and. What, is bio, what about its dioxin markers? <coughs> so, uh, the reason that I think the reason a lot of people talk about 2,4-D and dioxin at the same time is because um, ori the original use of 2,4-D was as a component of, of Agent Orange, uh, which was and so a Agent Orange is made up of 2,4-D, 2,4-5-T, and, and and dioxin was present as a contaminant of 2,4-5-T. So. Uh, so Agent Orange contained small concentrate. Well, the thing about the dioxin in there was it was not intentional. They weren't trying to put dioxin in the Agent Orange, but it was a contaminant during the production process, the chemical manufacturing process. Um, so that's why a lot of people talk about dioxin and 2,4-D at the same time. Um, 2,4-D itself uh, does not. It, uh, it, it's, it's a different chemical from from dioxin, and. Uh, as far as we know, it's not in the current formulation of 2,4-D. Um, but it, the dioxin was and is carcinogenic and it has no half-life. It's, it's a POP, persistent organic pollutant. Correct. Dio that's all correct about dioxin. Um, is 2,4-D a bio bioaccumulator? No. To, uh, like she said, to, uh, dioxin does bioaccumulate. 2,4-D uh, does not. In, in fact, that's one of the problems with we've talked about with the designing the exposure investigation is that it passes so quickly from the body that that's why we had all these logistical problems about how we were going to catch the catch the sample at the right time after an exposure so that we'd be able to we'd be able to measure it. But you found it, I mean, so how is it supposed to be? That, that means re relatively constant exposure is what, I mean the fact that it's just that it's um, detected so frequently in the U.S. population and means would suggest that um, most people are getting a little bit of it all the time. And that's legal? I, 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 can't, I can't comment if that's, that's good or bad, it just that's what we know, it's what, it's what it is. Um, so, so there's this, uh, the next question, where, where did the 2,4-D in the test results come from? Um, there's, there can be residuals in uh, on food products. It, it's, it's been measured in food pretty frequently, like su supermarket food. It's been. Um, can, I mean, beef or uh, I don't know. I mean, like I say, the fact that uh, most 
you know, most of the U.S. population has some in them. Um, uh, but it suggests that it's, it's out there. Weren't we higher than most? I'm sorry. Weren't we higher? I thought we were higher. You the 75 uh, we were in the 70. We were higher than the yeah. Um, well, and overall, the, the population that we studied here, uh, like we, we talked about over the 95th percentile, was pretty similar between, the, the 95th percentile was pretty similar between NHANES and, and our group. Um, I mean, it, it was a little bit higher. It yeah. was the 75th percentile that your study published in March said that we were fairly significantly higher than the NHANES. Can please keep to the questions and stop the dialogue Including yours, did you just know yet? Did you have any other questions? Yeah, there's, there's one more. There's one more. The, the, the last question is, um, uh, you know, what, what level of 24D is dangerous? And so to answer that question, I'm going to just explain how reference doses are, are derived. Um, and again, this, you know, I'm going to try to not inject any kind of, of, of judgment about it or evaluation. I'm just going to say how it is done. Um, or how it has been done. Uh, uh, what, what happens is, uh, there's, it mainly comes from animal studies. In the case of 2,4-D, it's, it's based on animal studies. Uh, what they'll do is take uh, several groups of animals and give each group a different dose of the chemical over some designated period of time. And they'll check all those animals for, uh, for health problems. They'll, they'll look for signs of disease or signs of toxicity in, in those different groups of animals. Um, because they want to, the way it's always worked in the past is that they they want to have they want to have one group where they see something happen. So, so the high dose group, um, uh, the high the high dose group is, is pretty high, and they, they so that they see something happen in the animals. And these doses are typically much higher than than anything that people are exposed to in in regular life in, in, in a normal setting. Um, and then those doses range down from there. Um, the the lowest dose where they see something happen, uh, then that's called well, it's called the lowest observable adverse effect level, the, the low L. And then there's another number called the, the no observable no observable adverse effect level. That's the highest dose where they saw nothing happen. So for most studies. You have one of those two. There's, there's usually either a low L or a no L, and they start from that dose, and then they start to, um, and, and usually that dose is still much higher than anything that people experience in, in normal life. But they assume that animals are different from people, and they assume that uh, the most sensitive, uh, they assume that the average person could be ten times more sensitive to the chemical than the average mouse or, or rat. And then they also assume that people are different from each other. So they assume that the most sensitive person might be 10 times more sensitive than the average person. Um, and there's some other, they call those uncertainty factors. And, that, and that's not really, it's not really very scientific. It's just, you know, fact, they just divide by tens. Um, so they take that lowest dose where something happened or that highest dose where nothing happened and divide it by these numbers and that's what they call the reference dose. They say below that dose, group, we are con pretty confident that the risk is low of, of people having uh, any, any health effects. Um, the, when we talk about endocrine disruptors, this is newer science than when that, that system was really designed. Um, and the significance of it is that these endocrine disruptors have effects at, low, at, at low, lower doses. Um, and so, what it also means is that the, the doses that people actually get re really rarely get actually tested in, in animals. So, so there's not an actual study where the same dose that people usually get in daily life is given to an animal and then they follow it for its whole life and see what happens. That, those kind of studies are very rare. And, and those studies have, uh, are being done more often now that people are gaining an understanding of endocrine disruption. But they're, they're newer really than the whole reference dose system. That, that exists. So, um, so I guess that's. Right. Sorry.
just don't point it towards the speaker. Um, so there is a reference dose for 240 um, uh, that was designed in the way that I described before, and uh, the dose and none of the results that we've seen so far from the fall sampling um, uh, are above. The, are, they're actually um, far below um, that reference dose that exists for 240. But the old sample, the, the, the reference dose, yeah. I just want to add something to Dave's excellent description of how reference doses are calculated. And as, as science has changed, we're, we're looking at ways to do this a little bit differently. Um, one of the things we know is is that um, when we when we're doing that kind of testing that Dave described, what we're measuring is essentially how much we give the animal, and that's what we're trying to measure essentially when we do our exposure investigation. What's the dose that people take in? And the reason we need concentration data is that the, the dose is expressed in how much chemical you take in. So that's an important metric. It's the metric that we measure when we do it in animal testing. So what we do know is that what you take in, it gets changed when it comes into the body, and a lot of times it is what when those, that these chemicals kind of are metabolized, it isn't the metabolite that's actually causing the harm that we see from some of these chemicals. Well, people may metabolize these chemicals differently than the animals that we test them on, and how much of the metabolite gets to wherever the effect is being caused may be different in people than it is in animals. And we're trying to account for these differences. We're trying to be a bit more accurate when we do this analysis. So one of the things that people do is they create mathematical models and calculate relative to how much we take in, how much of the bad stuff gets to the place where it causes harm. And so we have ways now for some of these chemicals and for some of the test animals what the difference is relative between the animal we're testing on versus the way humans metabolize these chemicals. And we look at that. And then, like Brian was talking about doing the calibration curve, we now use mathematical models and we have a curve of how much causes an effect in this dose, this dose, this dose. We make a curve from that and then we use a mathematical model to extrapolate to much lower doses. So we're trying to be, you know, there's always going to be stuff we don't know, but we're trying, as we learn more about it, we are trying to be a lot more accurate. So, and sometimes we actually get lucky and we have data that's based on people being exposed and we can just do it from that, but it's actually kind of rare. And that's not lucky. Yes, well, yeah, I mean, the one I can, I can think of is arsenic, and everybody's exposed to arsenic. Arsenic's a, a naturally occurring chemical, so because we have so much data on how much people are exposed to arsenic, we could use that. But again, that's really kind of rare. Okay. This just in. Um, I got a couple more questions. Um, is how, how can we know the additive or synergistic effects of these pesticides? Uh, of what the, those effects are, and we're only testing for two pesticides. And the answer is we can't. We don't, um, we know that everyone's exposed to not just Super-D and not just atrazine. We're all exposed to a mixture of whatever there is around us. And um, and I would say that um, the field of toxicology really struggles with knowing how how to account for that and how to assess the risk from those mixtures of chemicals. That there's, there's two different, I mean, there's basically three different ways that different chemicals can interact as far as the toxic effects. They can be, and two of them are mentioned here, they can be additive, meaning that you know you take a dose of this and a dose of this, and the effect is the sum of those two. That's, that's additive. Um, synergistic means that the effect is greater than you would predict from just adding up the doses of the two. Um, and then there's also antagonistic, meaning that sometimes two chemicals cancel, cancel each other's effects out. So, um, and that, and that, that's been documented also. But, but um, um, really, that, that whole field of understanding how these mixtures affect us is, is really in its infancy. So I, um, the answer is we, we don't know. Um, we, we can't know really how the, uh, the synergistic or additive effects of, of these pesticides.
Um, the 2,4-D concentration is found in 96% of the investigation participants is not peak exposure levels. How do we find the peak levels in our bodies? So um, that has to do with the timing. Um, like you said, these things are rapidly cleared from the, from the body, so you would have to um, collect a sample with, as soon as possible after the person took the 2,4-D into their body. That, that would give you, that would, that would tell you the, what the peak concentration was, what the their internal dose was at the peak of exposure. Um, so that's a, the answer to that is sort of timing. Uh, this last question, since my children have to put in them, and since there is no enhanced data for children under six, how can you ensure this, uh, this is safe for a developing body? And, and like you said before, we, I mean, we, we can't. We know, we know that uh, uh, it's, it's probably not unusual uh, for for an infant to have for for, a, for children to have 240 in them, we know that from the enhanced. But but uh, I, I would just, I'm just here's, I'm just assuming that children under six aren't probably that different from children o older than six. And that it, again is it's no judgment about whether that's okay or not okay. It's just we, it's just what is. It's just what what is measured um, in the out there. So um, uh, I guess that's I guess that's it. Do you have a yeah, I've got two. First one is, is there any accountability for these chemicals as they are being purchased? Uh, there's, there's two classifications for chemicals. One is as a general use pesticide, and the other is a restricted use pesticide. General use pesticides are available over the counter. Anybody can purchase them uh, and use them. There's, there are no restrictions. Most of the 11 actives are general use. Uh, matter of fact, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, the only one that I remember up there is atrazine is restricted use. Restricted use pesticides, um, in order to purchase them, you must have a pesticide applicator's license uh, of some sort in a category that would allow you to apply uh, a restricted use herbicide. Uh, and so that's the accountability. And we hold, in those particular situations, we hold the retailer selling that product accountable for making sure they only sell that product to a licensed applicator. And the other question is, uh, since no pesticides were found on my property, can I get an organic certification for my farm? Um, and and then there's a follow-on part, of, or do they uh, do different tests? And the answer will, I think we'll, I'll have to throw out there is, is one is it depends because there are multiple agencies out there that, that certify organic. Uh, ODA's got one program. And to be absolutely honest, I don't know what all goes into that certification. Um, so the person at ODA that does that, his name is Randy Black and he's in our commodities division. Um, and so you can either contact him or feel free to give me a call and I'll hook you up with him so we can figure out what that requirement is. Okay, anything else on the bench? <laughs>